Welcome to um, this discussion evening. My name is Seren Gröning. I'm president of REACH Research and Technology in Switzerland. We're um, a young grassroots think tank that was founded uh, two years ago by young professionals, students and researchers. And um, we try to connect science and society. Our goal is to create a science-friendly culture that profits from scientific research and potential without um, making unjustifiable risks. And for us, this comes with three main goals. The first is building trust in science. The second is to improve the awareness of scientific responsibility within science. And the third is to promote a well-rounded and uh, uh, fact-oriented public discourse about society and science. And there are, of course, many ways to achieve this. Um, we have now tried to go in one direction and try to improve science communication. Try to find out what is needed for effective science communication. And since we um, might be uh, some kind of experts in science policy, we're not the experts in communication. So we teamed up with the debating club Zurich um, to create a debating training and discussion training this semester. Um, within the critical thinking initiative of uh, ETH Zurich. Um, it's called Reach, Don't Preach, and it essentially contains uh, interactive discussion trainings with maximally 20 participants. So it will be a really intense training. It will be focused on, on a few people. Um, it will have three interactive sessions with three different topics. The first is human embryonic stem cells. The second, Kernenergie. Third, Tierversuche, and you already see here, two of them are going to be in German. And most importantly, maybe, deadline is 1st of October, so only two more days to sign up. Uh, there are still some places available, and um, if the whole enterprise is successful, we will continue it next semester. Now, what is the point with this uh, debate? So why do we link these things two together? Um, we don't want to... Um, take only our word for it that this is working, um, so we create a kind of a proof of principle example. So today we'll discuss about big data in kind of a special way. First, we'll have an expert panel with our two guests, whom I'd like to welcome right now. Um, first, I'd like to welcome Professor Abraham, ah, here you are, Abraham Bernstein. He is the chair of the informatics department here at UCH. And I'd like to welcome Georges Bignon. He's professor at the Bern University of Applied Science and um, Professor for Medical Informatics. Welcome, thanks a lot for coming today. And this first part, we'll just uh, tackle some general questions. What is big data and what does it mean? Why is it, has it become a buzzword in recent years? Now for the second part, well, we'll be joined by two members of the debating club, uh, Sebastian Held and Martin Reinhardt, who are over there. And they uh, have two appointed positions. So one is going to be rather skeptical, trying to find a blind the ointment of big data, and the other is going to uh, point out the potential of big data for our society. And they didn't get the question in advance, they did only get a short fact sheet and some resources so they could dig in. And um, their participation in this debate serves two purposes. First, we want to show that an informed discussion is possible even if you're not an expert in the topic. And the second goal is we want to show that you can achieve the ability to see and also embrace arguments that are not necessarily your opinion uh, within a debate. Both of these things are very crucial uh, in our point of view for a fruitful public debate about science. And uh, both things will also be taught during the debating course uh, we'll have this semester. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome on the stage Alain Bernstein, Serge Vignon. Welcome, and we'll start with the first part of our discussion. Oh, and I've, of course, forgot the third part is questions from the audience. Um, but since that is a general um, part of all our events, and usually every event um, you go to, um, I totally forgot about it. So, as a start, um, I'd really just to like to lay the ground what is big data. So, what is the buzz all about? 
um, just in a two or three short sentence, your definition of big data. Okay, um, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, big data, one of the most common definition, it's big volume of data, big velocity of treatment of the data, and big variety of the data. So that can be in healthcare, uh, it could be in telecommunication, in uh, consumption habit, and the goal of it is to identify correlation uh, that you wouldn't expect or you couldn't do, do by another analysis by processing this huge amount of data uh, fast enough and with a very uh, large variety of data to, to identify new rules, new knowledge. Thank you very much. The band sign, okay. copy paste or? Um, well, I think the, the formal definition is, a, is an excellent definition. Let me give you a more economically oriented definition. Um, what you have had in the last 20, 30 years is a massive uh, deterioration of cost of storing and processing data. Uh, the first level effect of it is that we do way more of it because it's cheaper. Uh, the second level effect is uh, that we then start building organizations and structures that actually rely on the fact that we're doing way more of this. So one example, I guess, is the often mentioned example of Google. They can collect massive amount of data about how people search and can therefore learn how to help you search better. And combined with the uh, three or four Vs, I, I would have actually added a fourth, uh, if not a fifth V, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the volume, velocity, variety, and I would have added veracity because a lot of the information you actually collect might be wrong. Uh, this gives you all kinds of new possibilities and opportunities. So wait, the wrong information gives you more opportunities? Uh, yes, so, so you, even though you collect more information and some of it might be wrong, uh, you can learn from the distributions that you have and get good insights. Okay, interesting. How do you go about that? Um, you're from the medical area, um, you're from, from uh, as I said, an economic perspective. So what are the approaches to find out what is right and what is wrong? What do you learn from all the mistakes you make with big data analysis? Well, one of the potential mistakes is to find an existing correlation with, which has uh, no relevance. One of the well-known example you may have heard it, there is a strong correlation between chocolate consumption per number of inhabitants in the country and the number of uh, Nobel Prizes. And Switzerland is very nice position, that's why we like to, to use that example. But almost all the countries fit in a nice diagonal. And of course, we know, except there is something we don't know about chocolate, but that, uh, that is um, not a, co a causal correlation. And we can laugh about it because it's easy, but uh, you could uh, think of a medical treatment based on that insight, which uh, has no real impact on the disease, uh, that might have uh, uh, adverse effects, and then it's, it's not funny anymore. Uh, so how do you differentiate the, the, the real correlation than the wrong one if you add uh, that some of the data might uh, even have a poor quality, so you could even increase that risk, how, you, how do you go uh, about it? Mm -hmm. And how do you do that in the end? Because uh, as we, we all know, we should not consume loads of chocolate just to become an open prize winner. So, what are the, where does big data help you to find out um, what correlations are true or wrong? Well, it's, uh, it's not that easy. One way I would say uh, would be to first make some hypothesis, like the, the, the usual uh, scientific way, and then get data and see if, uh, if you can validate the hypothesis uh, that, that you've done. So then you already restrict uh, because you wouldn't First, start with the question uh, about the correlation, chocolate and, and Nobel Prize. Uh, the other way would be to do it afterwards, after that uh, your uh, crunching machine tells you this is correlated with that, then to try to understand uh, is it really causal or is it just a hazard? And maybe it's because you don't have enough data because we, we talk about big data, but uh, we are not always there with the, with the high volumes. Uh, so you maybe need more data that would eliminate those uh, inadequate correlation. Thank you. Um, 
you talked again about volume, and also you mentioned it before, you had this degradation of computational power, of, of uh, storage possibilities. Is this really the one important factor? Hasn't there been like improvements in algorithms? We heard a lot about uh, Google's special um, algorithm to give you the, the suggestions for your searches. Um, is it really just uh, the pure possibilities, the raw power, or has there also been a sophistication, an increase in sophistication? Well, I, I, I think those things go hand in hand. There is a, bunch, a whole bunch of algorithms that can only be made possible by the increase of computational power. Uh, if, you, if you look at the first such change in predictive algorithms that have come about uh, in, in, the, in the 90s, I would say, you have a change from algorithms that assume that you have like 30, 40, 50, 100 data points to algorithms that assume that you have 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 data points. And that allows you to do things, if you can process those efficiently, allows you to do things that are previously assumed to be statistically wrong. Because if you have small numbers, statistics works different than when you have big numbers. What we have uh, seen recently is a change in technology that has allowed us not to look at, you know, uh, 50,000 data points, but of millions of data points, or even more, and that gave us the ability to build more sophisticated algorithms. Let me just pick one example. Uh, if you look at uh, these recently so many mentioned deep learning algorithms, one thing that spawned the new success of deep learning algorithms is because the gaming industry gave us GPUs, right? so these things that quickly render uh, images so we can game quickly, and people found out that those GPUs can be efficiently used to, uh, to compute deep learning models. So technology allows us to do build new models, and these new models are then being built, and then they pull new technology to be developed to actually do this even better. I think these things go hand in hand, and you have one of those typical feedback loops that accelerates uh, development. Okay, thanks. But so I can follow up on that. Um, still, there seems to be some kind of also qualitative shift, or at least it seems so, because um, I'm coming from statistics, I would just say many of the examples you mentioned are just regular statistics, so what, ex ex except for the deep learning algorithms, of course, but what makes these kind of algorithms so special and, and what differentiates them also from usual methods we know, we have known for a very long time in applying on more smaller data sets? So Hal Varian, uh, who you might know, is an econometrician, uh, and he's also the chief scientist. He, he used to be a, a department chair at, at Berkeley, uh, sorry, at Michigan, and he was then at Berkeley, and then Google hired him as its chief scientist. And Hal Varian wrote a paper for econometricians that say, listen guys, there are new methods out here that you can now use. You can use time series, for, exact, for example, to look at causation versus correlation problems. So there are qualitative changes in the algorithms that have done. I mean, you know, if you guys are all into it, we can stop this debate now. We can have an hour on the blackboard to discuss the changes in these methods. I think if you're interested in them, uh, please read Hal Varian's paper because he actually makes a very nice way of, of illustrating them uh, and illustrating these changes. Uh, I do think there is a qualitative change. Some of these algorithms make assumptions where regular statisticians would go, what? Um, but the, uh, the algorithms work out in the end because when it comes to large numbers, the error averages itself out again. So it's not always just things. So there's a wonderful, sorry, stop me if you want to. There's a wonderful paper that compares uh, um, logistic regression, which is a standard technique from statistics, with decision tree learning. And what this paper shows is that the larger the data set gets, you know, when you have small data set, logistic regression, it's a, it's a prediction technique that says whether you're uh, in one class or another, so it's a classification technique. For small data sets, logistic regression clearly outperforms uh, decision tree learners. However, the larger the data set gets, on average, overall data sets, uh, you know, you have performance, and at some point the performance is crosses, and the, the, the decision tree learner vastly outperforms the logistic regression. So I do think there is a qualitative change. There's also a change in what you can do with a large amounts of data. Some people have uh, realized that and are banking on it. Uh, some people have not. Thanks. We'll definitely put the paper on, online, but uh, actually I like the solution. You reference papers and uh, explain it so everybody can understand it. Um, before we go too much into the algorithm, so we have this qualitative difference. Um, I also want to go into the... Uh, data bases we can access. Um, we heard the example of Google, of course, each one of us is uh, feeding Google each day, um, always, almost every hour, every second. Um, 
But what about other domains where we might be interested in having big data or not interested, um, specifically the medical domain? So how far are we there? What kind of medical information is actually available online? Uh, and not online, but in, in big data, digital data sets? Well, today, not much, but in a year or two, it will change dramat dramatically. Our uh, five university hospital are um, investing to be able to uh, sequence the, the genome of a patient that would agree to, to give their genome for science research. Uh, the Canton de Vaux, uh, where I worked uh, until two years, um, wrote a policy and systematically uh, since two, year, two years ask uh, all incoming patients if they would agree to uh, give a blood sample for uh, research and if when the technology is there and, uh, and the machine to the sequence are there, if they would agree to have uh, their uh, DNA sequenced. Uh, they did it uh, very clearly by saying it won't be anonymized because there is, you can't anonymize your digital signature. It's, it's, it's you, each, each letter is, is your signature. You can code it so that you are not referenced with your name and address and phone numbers, but with a participant number. So they made it that clear. And 80% of the population over the last two years, this statistic was shown uh, last week in Geneva, 80% of the population says, okay, well, they are patients, they are uh, treated at the university hospital, they are in acute care, uh, so they have other worries when they are asked to, to do that. So maybe if you would, you would ask that uh, <clears throat> in the needed off, then maybe the, the rate might not be that high and there is a high trust because it's the physician that treats them that has them. But so the population by asking something which I would uh, technically phrase as a global consent because at the time of the question, maybe we'll come back later during the debate about that, uh, the, the patient, the citizen, they don't know what for will it be used. Um, so there is very high rate and um, now the um, the Swiss um, state will uh, uh, give a large amount of money to, uh, to allow uh, our university hospital and the, the two uh, technical schools of Zurich and Lausanne to build the, the IT infrastructure. And we are talking about uh, starting next year, over next year. And uh, the goal is to have a sequenced genome in, in, in numbers of thousands, tens of thousands, fifty thousands, because that is what the other uh, research team have in Hong Kong in the US. So that amount is huge. But we know now that the, the, the genome is, is not what you are. What you are is what the proteins uh, that are coded uh, generate. So to, to, to treat disease and to, um, you, you have to understand what's the, the, what we call phenotype, what's happening to, to the people. So you need observation. And the university hospital have also those observations because by law they have to document uh, the, the status of a patient when it comes to the hospital, what's the treatment is done, the outcome. But that is text. And now uh, where big data is uh, more adequate than statistic is how do you combine a two-page uh, report um, written uh, by a physician with a very uh, well-coded document? And in the report, you have negations, you have family history, the diseases of the parents, uh, of an uncle, and you have to analyze and dig through that what is relevant, because that is the big information, and correlate that uh, with the uh, genome information. And, uh, and there uh, is a huge potential. They are already the first success stories uh, that comes that some rare disease have been identified, that treatments have been found, but those are really uh, now uh, success stories that to, to promote it, but uh, we, we are getting there and quite soon. So, so in the end we will have um, comprehensive data sets of genetic information, genomic information, patient histories, all these uh, digitized data sets and who in the end will have access to that? 
this domain is, is uh, driven by the university hospital because they have the data, they have the patient, they have the consent, and they have the researcher. Uh, but when you want to enter in larger collaboration with another hospital, with a technical organization, with the ETH, and its uh, computing resources, then it gets uh, more complicated. So now there, there are uh, such system built uh, in our five university hospitals, and there are plans to uh, integrate those projects at, uh, at a national level, because even if you do that uh, for a whole region of Switzerland, it is still small comparing to, to other countries. So even the, the, the Swiss level is it's, it's big, but for, for some question, not big enough for big data. Thank you. Um, switching to a different kind of data sets, um, because we have to tackle all the topics, uh, the background for the, the uh, discussion later. Um, what is also often discussed in public, um, we had just the uh, election about the so-called Vorratsdatenspeicherung, eh, not the election, the vote on, um, uh, no, we didn't have to vote on that one, but there were discussions about Vorratsdatenspeicherung in Switzerland, so um, uh, uh, saving huge amounts of data, metadata, um, about our persons. We uh, always hear about Google knows everything, they, they uh, gather all this information, but what kind of information is actually gathered by different stakeholders um, when we are surfing, when we are writing emails. So what is kind of the middle to worst case scenario that I have to expect when somebody gets uh, my search history? I'm not sure I can answer this question. Um, I think there are uh, enough websites online that will give you their interpretation of the uh, conspiracy theories of what you can do and what you cannot do with your search data. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure I want to talk uh, uh, about Google because, I mean, let's talk about Google for a moment. Um, you enter search queries, right? So you enter keywords. These keywords get trans uh, translated to probably, Google doesn't tell people what they actually do, to statistical distributions of meaning. Um, so you have a distribution over what's the meaning of each word and then using those distributions of meaning of those keywords, what you're trying to do is you're trying to optimize the kind of answers you give that the people actually stay at Google and continue coming back such that you can sell advertisement. That's what Google does mostly. Uh, those of you with Android phones, uh, Google collects some other information. I do not have an Android phone, so I did not look into this. Uh, those of you who uh, have a fruit phone, uh, that company also collects data about you. It was just uh, made public, I think, yesterday that they collect 30 days worth of your meta information uh, of uh, who you message to. Um, if you have social networks, uh, there is another company there that collects a lot of information about your social networks. They can do a lot of, inf uh, a lot of stuff about that since one of the major uh, you know, rationales that... Uh, and your mother told you when you were small, don't hang out with the bad guys, bad things will happen to you. If you hang out with people, usually, often, you are similar to the people you hang out, right? If everybody you hang out with uh, has a certain interest in uh, getting a Beamer, most probably sooner or later you will be getting a Beamer. Um, sorry, a BMW for those of you who don't know what a Beamer is. Uh, I do not drive a Beamer. Um, so. All of these things can be used to infer information about you. It's not that this information wasn't available before, right? There is a, a company that collects every time you uh, participate in one of those, uh, um, you know, raffles, etc. You know, free balloon flight, free this, free that, and you leave your address. They collect information about you, and they usually know before the postal service knows when you change your apartment, because you probably told somebody the new address before you told the postal service. So those things were available before. What changes qualitatively is that they are suddenly available electronically and can be processed much faster in much larger volumes. So you can make better predictions. You can write profiles. And, and I would advise you to once try out and go to DuckDuckGo. I don't know whether you know DuckDuckGo. is a search engine that professes not to track you. Um, and just run the same queries on DuckDuckGo and on Google. Um, I'm always very happy when I Google my own name. I'm the top guy. Uh, and then I go to DuckDuckGo and frustration uh, uh, ensues. Um, I, I just think you need to understand you're leaving those traces. And those traces 
uh, can be used, oftentimes to give you better service, right? Google actually gives you better answers. It's not like they're abusing you. You're actually happy with the better answers. And most people who know about DuckDuckGo go back to Google, that I know at least, because the answers oftentimes are actually better. Uh, so you're enjoying this service, but you need to be aware that also Google can place better advertisement for that. So you're just leaving those traces, and those traces can be employed to make all kinds of predictions about you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we heard the gong, um, and you led the perfect ground for starting the more controversial discussion. I would like to welcome to the stage Sebastian and Martin. Also give them a round of applause. separate you two. Um, oh my, we're between? <laughs> we're in between. You, you have to keep them away from me when, if things get too tense. No, um, I want to follow up on, on what you said about the, the personalized information we have, the personalized information that um, Google or other providers gather about us, and they use it to give us better um, services. Um, one thing that is also often discussed about um, uh, this kind of services is that we're kind of a cocoon of information, um, only feedbacking that back to us, what we want to see. And, and you made it sound a little bit, okay, we had that all along. Uh, and earlier on, we hang out with some different kind of people. So the qualitative difference is just we have it digitized. Um, would you agree on that? Or do you see a clear difference now with the filter bubble, the so-called filter bubble we have on Facebook or on other social networks? Well, what has what has changed? It's easier to not be forced to leave our uh, you know personalized environment, right? So uh, before the internet, uh, if I wanted to talk to a scientist, the easiest way was to open my office door and walk across the hallway to another scientist who had his office across the hallway, and he was ninety nine percent of all times not precisely doing my kind of research. So I was forced to talk to somebody who thinks about different questions, etc. Now. The easiest way is to move my finger, uh, use some kind of telecommunication means to talk to somebody who thinks about precisely what I'm thinking about too, and there is the opportunity to actually not leave my comfort of my filter bubble, whatever. And I think there is plenty of evidence that shows that this leads to a balkanization of, uh, of society, that people actually continue get reinforcement that their own opinion is the own opinion. Let, let us quickly go through the U.S. election. Sorry, I'm going to take you there. Um, right. You don't talk about Google, but you talk about the U.S. election. Well, you know, okay. it's, it's, it's evident for everybody who's been in the U.S. You can watch Fox News, and you can watch MSNBC, and you actually think you're in two different countries with two different truths. And they reinforce their people's beliefs. So they are clearly two filter bubbles. And each of them, you know, just this is even TV. This is not, this is not Google, right? This is TV. Why? Because there is a large enough population such that you can customize and specialize to these parts and they don't get pushed into seeing articles that may not reinforce their beliefs. Mm -hmm. So, just to sum up, you would say that it's just become harder to step out. It's easier to step in, but harder to step out at the same time because you're never challenged with uh, any different views. It's easier to be in a filter bubble. Uh, I think you need to be more conscious about exiting a filter bubble. Is, is my, my okay. So you, so you need to go to DuckDuckGo. You need to turn, you know, turn off the personalization feature in order to get the other results. And I think that's true for each of these tools that you're using, each of the social networks you're using, etc. Okay. Thanks. Well, is that, not, is that not the very part of the problem that we got used to all these nice applications? Uh, we got used to using Facebook, all the nice services, and now it's very hard to break out of that bubble because uh, now they're changing their conditions, but you don't, we don't even notice because we have gotten used to good things. Okay, can I, can I pick, sorry, if you want to reply or should I pick that up? Since, since you're on this side, you're probably going to argue the positive side. So, so Marshall, Marshall, McLuh Marshall McLuhan said in the 60s, uh, every augmentation is an amputation. And I, I said this before, so every tool that you use improves certain capabilities, but others atrophy, right? So calculator, uh, 
Absolutely, we make, we make better, better calculations, but we lose the ability to do good calculations in our head. And the same is true of all other tools. So the question does not arise as this bad, should we kill it, should we you know, shut them down? The question is, how can we bring ethics and all of those questions of, of, of debate and of making sure that diversity is represented online into these algorithms and into these systems such that we have these abilities to actually get together with others. The Swiss Army was once described as the big equalizer, right? So when you went to army service, you were put together with people who you would otherwise not get together. Right? So that's the physical analogy that you had. And those of you who have served in the Swiss Army know that you probably met people you would have otherwise never met. Even though you would have seen them in a train, you wouldn't have met them and talked to them and had a beer with them. If we get rid of those mechanisms, the question becomes, and we need to invent new mechanisms, to actually ensure that conversation across boundaries still happens. And I completely agree, but big data comes with big, uh, you know, opportunities, but also with big challenges and those we need to overcome. For the record, if there was a Google at the time I had to go to the army, I would have chosen Google. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, it's okay. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's, um, I think many in here would have done the same. Uh, I don't know, I don't want to speak for everybody. Um, staying in the bubble discussion, um, uh, we have a really, or staying in a bubble as a whole, um, we have a really easy access to a huge amount of information. We also have huge, uh, a whole lot of access to medical information. Um, so from your experience in uh, medical informatics, um, or generally in, in, in healthcare, do you see that there is kind, uh, that it's getting more difficult to convey information, medical information to people because everybody's looking it up online and they're staying in kind of their reinforced bubbles um, which sometimes are completely opposite to what is actually considered healthy in, in, in medical terms. Um, depends if you ask uh, a physician or if you ask a patient. There, there is a survey which is done every year called the eHealth Barometer. And, um, and then uh, the two population, the, the health professional, are asked, do you believe the citizen can um, can understand medical information, and, and we should give them access to their uh, electronic health record. Eighty percent of the health professionals say no, no, they won't. They won't understand. Don't give them the information because they will go to Doctor Google, and it's better not to to engage them in that. And then uh, the same institute that uh, that is the EFS, so an institute that does survey about politics social aspects of every series, guys. They ask uh, about a thousand uh, people, uh, um, cancel all the selection bias, made it very right, and 80% of the uh, citizens said, of course, uh, I understand uh, that, and I want that information. So, um, it's, uh, there is a step about patient empowerment, and I think at the moment, uh, we as citizens, we have far too few information uh, about uh, the treatment we receive, uh, the medication, the exams uh, that are done. So we haven't reached the point where it's, we have so much information that we misuse it or, or uh, we, we put that in the bubble and, and, and just uh, keep what, uh, what fits us. At the moment, we don't have access uh, as, as a citizen to our health information. I would add like, to like that is and recently they found out that sometimes even the machines are better predictors for, for, for actually um, some, <coughs> some illnesses than doctors do. Because when you're in, in this uh, certain, certain state of you're your, your knowing someone, maybe you're, you're just uh, sinking too far, it's probably you're gonna miss something, and uh, they're they're a better predictor um, of of what what illnesses um, you could have because a doctor can't think of every illness there is with a specific type of uh, of, um, of factors you see. Mm -hmm. Let me support him. There is a recent study uh, published <laughs> in Nature Communications. I believe it's Nature Communications 
that uh, machines are better at analyzing certain um, pathologic samples and deciding whether pancreatic cancer is present or not. I think it was published about two or three weeks ago. So we, we absolutely have prediction, prediction, uh, sorry, prediction tasks where machines are better than physicians. I mean, they're, you know, it's the usual study, blah, blah, et cetera, with the nice statistics, et cetera. But this machine will not tell me what I need to do now, right? I mean, now I have a diagnosis. And now the question is, what is next? And I think that's where the physicians come in, into play, and also for other things. Right? So we have it now for one disease. So I, I completely support this. You know, machines are sometimes very, very good. Um, but just to understand it correctly, that only counts for re really um, specialized domains. So you've got a medical doctor um, and, and scientist inputting the data, and you've got a um, specific diagnostic out there. Um, what is also being tried um, is using all kind of our traces in the end to make medical predictions. So how far are we with that? How far can we say just by my Google queries, by um, maybe some previous information about the disease, can I predict what my risk factors are or what my actual diseases are? We all often hear that example of the um, Google knowing earlier that you're pregnant uh, for yourself. I don't know whether that's true actually, but... Um... <laughs> okay, you, uh, you anticipated on my... Uh... One of my answers, uh, I will make um, a different one. I talked recently with a startup company that is working uh, to, to develop an app that reads data from sensors and those sensors uh, should monitor the capabilities of patients suffering from multiple sclerosis, which is a slowly generative, degenerative disease, to, to be able to monitor this evolution and then show if there is an, an impact uh, on different treatment that would slow down the negative evolution. And then uh, we, we discuss uh, if we could uh, hook this application uh, to a personal health record platform that, uh, that is a research project that I'm working on. And, um, and the, the guys from the startup says, well, we, we, we'd rather not. And I said, well, why? Well, we, we have our own server. I said, well, shouldn't the data go to the research team and, and to the patient? And they said, yeah, okay, but we'd like a copy. And I said, well, what for? And they said, well, uh, for further analysis. And I said, which one? What, uh, what's your target? And they said, well, we don't know, but uh, if we go to venture capitalists, then we'll get uh, finance if, uh, if we are the owner of the data. So now it's... Even worse that Google that does that with an intent because they know the value of the data, they know what they are doing. The business model has spread out that uh, startups, and that was in Switzerland, it's not Silicon Valley, it was in Zurich. Um, they now have the pressure that they will be uh, evaluated not only on the cool things they done and the added value, but because they will gather data and it is the, the new asset, the new oil. And I was very surprised that I got that in a project discussion. And it's, it's here, uh, 2016, Zurich people say, well, I, I want to gather private data of patients because I will make money out of it. I don't know how, but I will make <laughs> money out of it. I think I even know the, the startup you mentioned in that. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I think that's uh, one core problem of the whole thing. I might agree to give my information to one person, but then this person will uh, forward it to whoever they want. And it might end up uh, to someone that is not, does not uh, use it in my interest. For example, my health uh, information. If it goes forward up to an insurance company, they might be forced to raise my insurance level, so I have to pay more in the end. And uh, how can you avoid that? How can you avoid that I have to pay more for my insurance? I think it's, uh, it's one of the risks. Uh, it's not only that Google will know in which restaurant you go or so, because I don't care so much about it, and maybe uh, I get good advice, but it's about the, the profiling. And the first business case is advertisement. You get advertisement to, to buy the same thing that your neighbor is, uh, is buying. Um, well, no. It's, it's already not so good, but it's okay. But it's the, the negative profiling to assess risks. And of course, there is the example of the health insurance. 
but how about uh, companies that will assess the risk to employ you uh, on it according to your health, to your social behavior? Uh, how about uh, university that would uh, hire and, and profile postdoc candidates according to uh, uh, the whole profile at uh, e -learning, on e-learning platform and, and, and survey? So you, you will get uh, profiled and, and uh, you are risk, you have a risk profile and I think that is uh, quite problematic and I mean it's, it's the business of insurer to, to assess the risk. So they, they have uh, almost the duty to use all information and, and to, to evaluate that. So it's, it's very uh, difficult. Uh, all business model goes toward that. My answer to that, because we're actually at the moment in a, in a place where it actually happens nowadays. It happened in the 80s, it happened in the 70s. When you had your credit card, you were assessed on risk. You're assessed on risk and what you're paying for. And you, even now, you're, you're actually, if someone looks at your credit score, you're, you're actually assessed on this risk. So you're, you're doing it in, uh, even in, in, uh, in insurance nowadays. Now we just do it afterwards. Now we do it beforehand. An insurer might even better his service to you as, a, as someone who, who is actually at risk to reduce your risk because he can make more money out of it. So it has, has also benefits for you if someone actually cares about you. This insurer could care about you because he could ma make more profit out of you if he reduces your risk. So let me, let me just add something to this. So there, there are insurances in Switzerland, I believe, or think that will allow you to lower your uh, car insurance cost if you're prepared to put a black box in your car that measures acceleration and driving style. Uh, obviously what you are doing is you are accepting the black box in your car and what the insurance then assumes is that you signal to them that you're prepared to drive in a more uh, you know acceptable means that will lower your risk of um, incurring an accident. You can think whatever you want to think of that. Uh, it's at the moment, in contrast to the healthcare example that uh, the gentleman over there mentioned, it's your free choice. You can decide to put the black box in your car or to pay the higher insurance rate. That is some kind of profiling. Guys between 18 and 22 make more accidents than anybody else. That's, that's also profiling. It's just a profiling with a certain age range and it's absolutely unspecific. The contrast to the healthcare example that you mentioned is, um, you don't control it. You cannot show up at the healthcare insurance and say, I'm anonymous, if they have access to your health record because you've ceased to be anonymous. They know it. They know you. And now suddenly the situation comes that you may not get insurance anymore. And I think that is a highly difficult moral question that we as a society need to ask ourselves. What are the moral consequences of profiling? What are the moral implications of these capabilities? And as a secondary effect, what kind of legislation about privacy and data protection do we intend to take based on these moral decisions? At the moment, we are in the system where we say, no, 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 no data, right? Nobody gets my data. It should be protected, it should be protected, it should be protected. But I may be in a situation where I want to share my data. There was an example made two weeks ago, sorry, two days ago. If you are in terminal cancer, you're prepared to give all your data away if somebody finds a cure, right? You don't care about privacy anymore. Uh, that is a very different situation when you're not in that situation. I think what we need is an understanding, a both ethical understanding as well as a legal understanding that is much more fine-grained about what it means to do data protection. Thanks. Well, our true intention here is to, uh, we have a big cake of data and we offer them one slice. But you don't notice that we offer one after another and before we notice we have given the whole cake to different people which then in turn reassemble the entire cake. And this, that is the big escalation that has happened lately, that they started to uh, uh, summarize the information and from the little bits that might seem uh, irrelevant, irrelevant to us, they can get much more out of it now. And that's why we should be vigilant and uh, avoid these uh, interests of big companies. Thanks. Um, just a short up because we've been touching on, on kind of a lot of different topics. Um, we've been talking about ownership of data, so who has, who owns data, can make money out of it, or use it for other 
uh, purposes. We have talk about, uh, talked about access to data. And um, I almost have to summarize both of them um, under, the, under the keyword informational disequilibrium. So at some point, there are different rights and different um, uh, access rights, different ownership rights with that data. And first, I would like to um, uh, focus on the access right be because we've just been talking about that. How should we go forward um, with regard to big data when it comes to giving consent? And you mentioned before, uh, Professor Bignon, um, your page to giving universal consent. So I, as a patient, have no idea what is happening with that data. Um, I probably also don't have the possibility to retract my consent later on. Or yes, you, you can do that. Okay. But, but still, um, uh, Martin made a good point. Um, what kind of system could we implement to have kind of a uh, leveled possibility to give access, to give, also give trust? Because usually I don't give trust wholeheartedly. I select the people uh, I uh, divide information with. Well, the data protection law in Switzerland says that for uh, having access to personal data and Personal data is about uh, uh, your job, your health, your income, so it's quite broad. Uh, an informed, explicit consent is needed. So the, the legal framework is there. That means you have to explain the person uh, who will use the data, what for, how long, and in, in which context. And you have to do that explicitly. The written form is better. Uh, if you ask that, then keep a note that uh, you, you've done it. Now, in the healthcare system, if you do that, then uh, a hospital could not inform your um, your general practitioner, house uh, about the medication he's giving you without you to sign something. So it will block processes that, that have good intent and make things very complicated. So uh, if we want to do everything correctly according to that, then uh, you have a lawyer that follows you and, and sign all the, the contracts that are needed for all information exchange. So uh, now we are in the status that it's kind of okay that when you're in treatment people exchange information it's okay that the university hospital gather with your consent, uh, your uh, genome, without explaining you what for. But uh, I think it, we are in a transition. We have to find a practical way that people are uh, constantly informed, also in a way that they can understand uh, what, what is the question. It's a real challenge. Uh, because here we are among educated people, uh, but you have to take that to 8 million uh, Swiss citizens. About 10% of our population is hospitalized in one year. That's uh, about 1 million people that are hospitalized, counting all those that go for a, a check or just to, to, to their general practitioner. We have to inform millions of people next year about what is explicit informed consent. I'm not sure the result will be better. So how do, how do we go from, uh, from here? And uh, it, it, it needs uh, such debate as today. Uh, it needs the involvement of, of patient organization, of, uh, of, of, of the society to say, well, we, we, have, we want to have some barrier, uh, but it's, it's a challenge. It's really mm -hmm. a challenge. Yeah, and it won't work by writing a 100-page PDF file and uh, giving the option to read it, and then you just have to take it at the bottom, so that's for sure. Yeah, thanks. Uh, following up on that point, um, we've now been talking about medical data, but um, each one of us has signed terms of conduct from uh, Google, Facebook, and just out of curiosity, is there anybody in this room who has actually read that? Okay, you have not signed it, but we have one who has uh, read it. Bravo, because I, I never did that. Um, so I saw a quote, either you read them or you sign them. So I think it's... <laughs> so we actually, have, we actually have two people in there who know what is written in there. Um, and, and, and that's a, a very valid point. So wherever 
data is collected, be it in the medical domain, be it uh, by the state, be it by private companies, we sign these kind of terms of conduct without actually knowing what uh, is written in there and what they're allowed to do with that. And it's a yes on how can I actually improve um, the knowledge, the consent, so the informed consent of people signing these things? Or is there even a need from your point of view? I'm not quite sure why I need to answer this question or why you're asking me this question. I think what we, and, and, and uh, you know, Serge, Serge alluded to this, we need to find a way to explain these informed consent contracts in no uh, unmistakable, simple ways. And I don't think we can do this today. I don't think we can do this today. It's not the kind of research that I do. Uh, it's a very complex situation uh, because we not always get asked these questions when we are at wits. And when we actually want to, uh, as, as, you know, as you explained some examples before, when we want to think about these things, right? Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether this, there is a solution today, but we need to find these solutions. And they need to be find, we need to find solutions where we can revise the kind of consent we've given at a later stage, uh, because we may change our opinions over time. As I said before, depending on where you are, in, in a disease or where you are in your life, you may be agreeing to other terms than at earlier points. And I think there is research needed. Sorry, I'm a scientist. Uh, there is research needed in terms of how to do this, how to explain this simply uh, in a way that the general population understands this. So surely is that also where the Digital Society Initiative of UCH is going towards, or is that... Well, if you're, if you're alluding to that, Yes, uh, one of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to get uh, uh, lawyers, ethicists, um, sociologists, uh, computer scientists, and uh, medical uh, researchers at a table to ask ourselves precisely the questions, how can we combine big data sets that are anonymized with uh, what we call small data sets, which is non-anonymized uh, data about individuals, Note, those do not need to be smaller than the big data sets. If it's the genome sequencing and all the omics, as it's called, it may actually be more data than the big data set in order to give people individualized recommendations. There are ethical questions. What is the ethics of this? You know, maybe you would be prepared, ethically speaking, if you have a patient who's about to die, that patient may be, ethically, it's correct to share this data with somebody else, even though, you know, but... What's the legal setup? What is the legal setup that needs to go, go together with this? I think this is a multidisciplinary question. As I said, ethics. There's a sociological question. How do people understand this? You know, How do people talk about this? And this is a whole package that needs to be looked at holistically. One of the things we're trying to do at the Digital Society Initiative at the University of Zurich, which we launched two weeks ago, is get together people from many, many disciplines to look at these things holistically. The medical domain is one. Another domain might be faith. A lot of people express faith today through, uh, you know, through uh, computer-mediated means. Do I want everybody to know the fact uh, that I maintain a, uh, a digital gravestone for my pet, or do I not want to do that? Um, and there is all kinds of questions of how society changes, and society does change, uh, and, and how we want to look at them. And we want to look at those things holistically for many disciplines. No reviews. Thanks. You want to direct before? Yeah, there might be new uh, professions. Maybe we need uh, intermediaries, people that are advising uh, people how to manage their, their data. You have an insurance broker that, uh, that you can ask and they will advise you uh, what coverage you need for, uh, uh, for your pension plan or uh, uh, for other things. You have a financial counselor that uh, will look at, uh, at your assets and, and uh, advise you about investment and savings. Maybe for data, uh, there, there will be new profession of people that will tell you, well, you should share that because that will bring you benefit and for that, be careful. And, uh, and I think that, uh, that actually it will occur um, either coming uh, in the healthcare system from the health professional because maybe uh, a 10 year trained physician uh, should put his energy uh, at, at, uh, at the treatment 
that explaining uh, data protection law. So who's going to do that? Uh, and, and maybe there, there will be new, uh, new businesses uh, on that. Maybe your data is worth something, and somebody will tell, well, I'll take care of your digital asset. Uh, I think that uh, we might be surprised in, in, in curious uh, emerging of, uh, of new roles. Thank you. You wanted to add something? Yeah, I wanted to add something. It's like when we're talking about everything, everyone involving, we should actually think about getting these things not too uh, heavy overloaded so that we're having a common consent in a society where we have, where we think about what we're agreeing on data, what is normal use, and this everything that goes about normal use should be explained, but everything that's in a consent should be uh, should be should be just uh, like there is a catalog from 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 a government or something what's normal use, and then we should just explain everything that's above normal use, and not complicate everything that's in there. But following up, and I wouldn't that require um, finding a society, societal opinion on what is above that average. So how are you going to find that? Um, in Switzerland, we have <laughs> actually found a system where we express our common consent, what we want to do. And I think before that, uh, before we actually go into that uh, voting or anything like that, we should actually have this discussion we're having here, we're having outside, which is actually probably popping up in the next few years when, when these solutions come. And probably should start right now because People, uh, people will be uh, in the backlog um, or sending it back when, when, when their the data um, is set and not, um, not conf and confronted with the problems they have. And uh, we should start the discussion, discussion now with mm -hmm. everyone, even well, those who can't. Do well, it. sorry to interrupt, but that solution would not solve anything. It's just on the wrong scale. Nowadays, the companies are located on the Bahamas or wherever they are, and the traffic goes uh, around the entire world. So how would that protect us from, uh, from anything if the laws in Switzerland are in place? I just see uh, a great difficulty in bringing the world together on a common point of view, because the traffic will go to the US nevertheless, no matter what laws we have here. That's a valid point, but still we need to find solutions. And Switzerland's the only way, place where we can hold the vote. And um, for, for the last part of the um, uh, moderated discussion, I would like to focus on, on, on that part, so on this finding this kind of consent. Um, you want to add something, sir? Okay. To react to that, because it, it, uh, it sounds like a good idea, but I also have a doubt. Is it possible to find a, a consent like the, the Swiss? Uh, consensus uh, ethnic uh, on such a topic <coughs> and our, uh, is our parliament uh, capable of discussing that? Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's really, uh, won't it become uh, polluted by the, the usual uh, left-wing, right-wing discussion and, and, and being misused? Maybe we can go another way is to work on transparency information to work on alternatives. I'm sure there will be the emergence of other search engines that have other politics and give the choice not to our parliament to define that, but to each individual and which reach the same goal that the, the democracy uh, is, is our asset but instead of putting that uh, in, in a broad cons consensus where I'm not sure the literacy of all the social groups of Switzerland will it make it really ethical to, to find an agreement and if that would be really valid and how long would that be because it's, it's changing and, and, and uh, our laws and, and, and social rules are on a time scale of 10, 20 years, 50 years and maybe if we go the other way and, and empower each citizen and he makes him choice or her choice for his data. And, and go that way bottom up. Hmm. Thank you very much. With that, you kind of answered a question I did not have the chance to uh, ask you, uh, because that's the point. Um, 
I want to make just to shortly summarize. We heard about um, the existing information disequilibrium. We have um, companies all over the world who have data about us. We've got government agencies who have data about us. We as individuals cannot, in all cases, give informed consent or, or uh, give consent at all. Um, so the first question, um, no, actually, you answer my second question about how to improve that. The first question would be, what is the biggest danger from that? Or is that even a danger? Because um, we, as we heard, we get better services by Google. Um, they get some information. Is that even a problem for us? Is it a, a problem for um, our possibility to, to gauge in public discourse? Or should we actually enforce some kind of um, security uh, uh, limits which will uh, allow us, the citizens or the government, to step in and kind of equilibrize this, this, informa uh, this information disequilibrium, so give equal access to different kind of information? I would like to try to answer that, that point. Uh, there is uh, a report uh, from the World Economic Forum that uh, was written I think, three or four years ago, which addressed that uh, by saying there is an imbalance between we as individuals and actors that manage data. Um, first example is try to negotiate with uh, one of those big players about the, uh, the general terms and condition. You, you cannot. Uh, then there is another um, asymmetry is that um, since we're not talking about Google. Uh, <laughs> We can, uh, Mr. Benson, if you're talking about Google, you can. Yeah. Um, those companies, they know how much your data is worth. They know their business model, uh, how much they can use that for uh, advertisement. And they also know how much uh, the development of uh, maps or other services cost. So they know the price of the service that they are offering you for free and they know the value, so they, they know both terms of deal. And you buy a service and you don't know the price, and you pay with the currency which is your data and you don't know the value. And the worst thing about that is even if you knew it, you're on your own. And if you say, well, I don't want to enter that deal, that doesn't make any difference for Google because uh, they, they work on the massive. So that gives in loop more and more power to those companies because they have an asymmetry on their information. It's like you, you try on a, uh, in Northern Africa to, uh, to discuss the price of a, of a carpet and the one who sells you don't know the dimension, you don't know the color, you don't know nothing, and, and, and you have to, to do a deal, you cannot even negotiate. Uh, and those two asymmetry are the main risk because those companies grow fast and the asymmetry is, uh, is growing and, um, and that doesn't leave the individual with any solution. So uh, we, we have to fight for transparency and, and to, to have another model of those deals where you use a service for free and you pay with a currency that you don't, uh, you don't manage. And, and we need alternatives and uh, if, if there was other services that you could pay, maybe uh, some of us will, will start to, to pay for the services and you know what you get and what for. What we also need is a right to forget, which is unlimited and can be used at any time you want. Another uh, possibility would be to put a timestamp a time stamp on that information, so that it, it expires after a few years, and that you have to renew your consent. So a technical solution, not a jurisdictional? Would uh, include both. I'm looking to that, so to get a more uplifting uh, uh, perspective or vision of how we're um, where we're heading towards. Oh, I'm, I'm I'm not quite sure why the sides have any semantics. Um. <clears throat> because I tell so as a moderator. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> uh, I'm, I'm being told to take a point of view, so I need to make the point that I'm taking a point of view. I, I think we've now been focusing very much on the negative aspects of, uh, of the increased exchange of information, and obviously it's something that we all think about, otherwise you wouldn't be sitting in this room, right? So that we have a wonderful case of uh, by self-selection, uh, you're sitting in this room because you're worried about this topic or just because you like debating and you didn't have any plans to that. Um, and it's raining outside. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's awful weather outside, right? Um, however, we have to understand that many good things have come it's from, from this data. Um, I mean, there are patients who have uh, empowered themselves to get their own data, do their own research and have proposed to their doctors treatments that have uh, improve their health status. These things have happened. Uh, these things have happened today uh, with the possibilities today because they were able to get to information, they were able to get access to medical journals, they were able to get to these things because some physicians just don't have the time to research issues that may be very intricate, very specialized diseases, etc. We are in a society where we have the choice of using things like DuckDuckGo or others where we can choose to disclose some information and not to disclose other information. Uh, we are in a society where we can do some of these things at least, and other things uh, we cannot. There are some dangers that we cannot control, and uh, I don't think we should go all, all out to gloom. Uh, let's just not forget, uh, you know, 40 years ago there were all these nuclear rockets in Europe, and everybody thought we'll soon go down in a big, uh, in a big nuclear boom. We didn't. We developed means to deal with this, and uh, whether we're in a more stable society today or not is not to me to judge. That's what political scientists should do, or historians. But what it is, is this is a challenge that we have today, and we need to work on this challenge and develop the means to deal with them. The fact that we're standing here and discussing them means that we're raising awareness and we're discussing them. So is data feudalism a danger for democracy? It would be a huge danger for democracy if we were not to have this discussion, but we're having it. And that's the job of universities, that's at least my opinion, is to reflect on changes out there in society and think up solutions to the problems we have. So I'm not that kind of, oh, we're all going to go to gloom and uh, some, uh, a handful of companies are going to own us. Uh, I actually think that the fall of communication costs also allows me to collaborate with people I would otherwise not be able to collaborate and to do things that I could otherwise not do. And look at the Wikipedia. Uh, look at open source software and look at other things that we would have not been able to do unless information exchange would have been so cheap and unless information exchange would have been so easy. So, you asked me to give you an uplifting statement. I think what we're looking at is we're looking at something that comes with chances and it comes with dangers. And in some way, big data comes with big responsibilities. And now it's our job, right, and your job to think about how to take up on those responsibilities and think about them. There are people, and Sarah is not mentioning it because he's involved in it, who are actually thinking up of software systems where you control your own data and you give your own consent, whether your data should be used for X and not for Y. There are people in Switzerland who think how should legislation look like uh, if you have control over your data. So these things do happen, and it's our job to make them happen, right? So you are uh, the young people of today, you are the students, you are the people who are going to live in this society that's going to be made by these technologies. So it's your job to help us think about them uh, because you're going to live in the society you're helping to build right now. And so I'm, I'm actually not a pessimist, but maybe it's just uh, you cannot be a scientist if you're a pessimist. You have to be an optimist because you're trying to do these things nobody else has done. Uh, so I'm actually not a pessimist. I just think it's issues that we need to discuss and we need to think about them. <coughs> Let me just give you one example. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, one example. Um, I talked to a guy, he's a science fiction author, and he puts all his books on his website. And I'm going away from data protection law because it's married with so many personal feelings, and I'm going to copyright law. Right? So this guy puts all his books onto his website and says, if you like it, buy it. So those people download the book, and he has the consent of the publisher, download the book, and ask him, so how do I pay you? And the only answer he can give is, go to the store, buy the book. Why? Because if you don't live in the same country where he lives, he has no idea who owns what percentage on the rights, on the royalties, etc., 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 etc. This just shows, in a completely different domain, that our 
laws are not made for these kinds of interboundary exchange. They are not made for the capabilities we have today. And that's what we need to do. We need to think about, and that's why I say, about the moral framework we want to apply, about the legal framework that builds on this moral framework, and about the technology that supports all of these things. And that's what we need to build. You're looking for a PhD thesis, that's what you should focus on. It's going to be one of the most important things society needs to work on. <laughs> Thank you very much for this wonderful, uh, uplifting statement. Um, and over to Sebastian, even more uplifting. No, uh, actually, I think we can profit as a society from this. Because normally we enclose information on ourselves, on what we do, on who we are. We're not actually displaying every, everyone who we are. And uh, it shouldn't matter to anyone um, what we are. We're, 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 we went uh, away and this way we have, <coughs> we went reflect on what, what we are, and we shouldn't be ashamed of. And that's the, that's also a big thing we're we're actually so talking about. We're thinking in an old way about things that are new, like we're we're having all those data out there. They were somewhere available for someone, and everyone who wanted to get them could get them in a in in a way earlier on. But now we should think of how we display ourselves is does it matter to us or does it or does it not matter and <clears throat> in a way democracy could actually profit from this because everyone could assess or access and assess the information uh, he needs to he wouldn't get earlier on um, it might even be big data sets we, we we acquire so that we can actually make better decisions for us, for our society, and for, <clears throat> for a better living for all of us. And therefore, I'm not concerned that we, we're uh, entering a phase, um, a phase of, uh, of, 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 of uh, oppression. We're actually entering a phase of discovery. We're actually entering a phase of where we can change things the way we could never before. And that's why we should embrace it and not, uh, not, not, not hinder it from, from being there. Thanks. Even though I must say now it's even too uplifting, I, I, I would really like to give back the, the point to, to uh, you two, but I will signal that we have reached a time for um, audience question. So maybe the first question, a critical one, so we can balance it out a little bit. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, first. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I actually have... Uh, we have profiled you, you are the one who uh, didn't us <laughs> uh, on uh, the Google, so we, we kind yeah. of already know a little bit of... Yeah, you it. already know that I'm not using Google and I don't have a Facebook account, uh, good God. Um, I have uh, two quick questions, or maybe they're not so quick if you want to answer them completely. Um, the first one is, how can we prevent punishment by not giving data to companies. For example, like if you're not using a tracker uh, in a healthcare company, uh, right now it's seen as a um, reward that you're using one. But if most people are using one and you're not using one, then basically that's a punishment that you're not using one. And the second one is uh, your thoughts on all Swiss data should stay in Switzerland. Who wants to answer? Sorry, I, I think you're asking a legal question. The first question is a legal question and a regulatory question where we need to decide what the regulatory principles are behind them. Uh, one of the principles we have, and, and sorry, I'm on very thin ice, I'm not a medical, actually you should answer this question, right? Um, uh, I was trying to. <laughs> okay, sorry, you were asking this question. No. Um, um, I, was, uh, I was at the Swiss Parliament in, uh, in uh, Spectator, Visitors balcony. Visitors when they address that topic, and, um, and on one side, it's obvious that you should not allow for social basis health insurance that people when they give data they receive a discount. But other people say, well, it's a social uh, insurance. There is solidarity between all. Uh, shouldn't there be an incentive that people having a healthier behavior 
uh, get rewarded for that. And it's very slippery slope uh, because, uh, and then we move from legal to ethic. Uh, people that don't have a good lifestyle according to some people, should they be, should they be punished? Because the, if you do that for uh, having one of those uh, activity tracker that gives you like uh, five two springs uh, reduction, it's not that much a big, big deal. Behind it, there is a lot of uh, uh, lot of issues that tackles the solidarity, but the solidarity to also uh, cover the cost of, uh, of sick people can be reversed. There is also a solidarity to take care of your health so that you lower the cost. So it's uh, it's really a uh, uh, move to ethic where you have two uh, two roles uh, that uh, get together. So uh, the, the Parliament decided for the electronic uh, health record because that was the topic that it should be uh, so-called uh, free for patient to, to have one and uh, the health insurance are not allowed to, to give a discount if you open an electronic health record or not. But uh, the question comes back to another door and um, we, we have to tackle that. And that was the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, Wait, there was a second question regarding the service, data service in Switzerland, but um, that's more or less a question of tech, technical feasibility. No, I think it's a not, legal question not just as much. We need to decide what we want to do and we need to decide it. I mean, in some way, there is also the inverse question. Why should I forbid you from uh, bringing your, taking your data to the Bahamas? Uh, you know, if we are in a liberal country, you should make an informed decision. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just taking... Right, I'm in the domain. Right now. I'm taking the opposite position. Right, so one is a, a a government that protects you from all evil, and another one is a government that says, no, I'm not going to protect you from evil. You should make an informed decision. I I agree, it needs to be an informed decision and not just a decision. <coughs> <coughs> but there is the, as I said, there is the inverse opinion. You should make an informed decision, as long as the asymmetry is not there. That you know, I I, I can't survive without using. Uh, you know, Bahama, Bahama Social Net Inc. Uh, uh, product, right? <sighs> Again, I, I think it is a very interesting debate, and there is a moral question, an ethical question at, the, at its ground, and there are some legal uh, implications that we need to talk. I don't think there is a clear answer today. We'll land you again in one year when the Digital Society Initiative has Find worked, all, worked, the answers, and yeah. then uh, we uh, want some answers there. I don't want to be out of business, I want to continue research, right? <laughs> Good. And um, a second question um, up here. The, yeah. And then there, was a, there were quite a lot of other ones. Good. <laughs> yeah, my question is, why don't we talk about Google? I mean, they're like we, everybody was like probably thinking, yeah, Google's going to be a subject today but like it wasn't really so that was my question why i can answer it from the moderator's point of view um because google is a one representative um from our perspective one representative of those data collectors so we didn't want to focus face uh, focus on google because we could equally have focused on facebook on twitter and on all the um also private and, and public uh, data collectors so that was my reason why i did not specifically target one company did that answer the question? Okay, good. There were more questions. So, um, yes, oh, right there. Thanks very much for a very interesting debate. Um, I have a question. I've been living in Sweden for the last two years. And um, when I came there, it didn't take long for me to realize that they have a bit of a different relationship to data protection. So, for example, once I was reg registered in the... Um, Swedish registry, you could um, Google my name and everyone saw where I lived and my phone number and everything was there. So being a Swiss citizen, in the beginning I was a bit concerned. Um, also another example is that um, it is taken a blood sample from every baby that is born for medical purposes later on. So they have huge um, databases with genetic data and um, blood samples. And it doesn't seem to be a big issue there. It's just no issue. So um, 
being back in Switzerland now, I'm a bit wondering what is, why is it that in Switzerland it seems to be so a suspicious meaning towards new things, towards data sharing, towards genetic testing, and I was wondering whether you could maybe um, speculate about that. Okay. Um, Can you hand over the microphone to your colleague? Right next to you for the next question. But yeah, first the answers. Okay, it's, it's good that you mentioned speculation because I have a few answers, but they are speculations. Uh, I visited uh, the healthcare system of uh, Denmark, Finland, Estonia, uh, Netherlands lately, and noticed the same thing. I was I was jealous uh, to see that Estonia is is more advanced uh, than we are uh, on uh, on a scale for e-government from the thirty European countries. Uh, Switzerland is on place thirty. Um, and why? Um, one. My hypothesis is that uh, we had a system, uh, the, the scandal des fiches. In the 90s, uh, the, the state gathered data with good intents, um, people not so far from the army that uh, is allowing people to meet each other and, 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 and meet nice people. The, 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 the same people gathered data and 900,000 Swiss citizens uh, were suspecting of having dangerous behavior, and that that was uh, that broke the trust for long time. I think there is still some stigma of that. The other uh, uh, hypothesis I make is that uh, Switzerland has a lot of monopoles. Uh, we are breaking them slowly, but there was a monopole of uh, from the brewery, uh, monopole in the deep they are monopoly in the healthcare, and and uh, those monopoles are not interesting that uh, the data is is uh, is transmitted. Uh, I have an example for the electronic health record. Uh, a lobby um, made it impossible to use uh, citizen ID, which is our uh, social security number, uh, by arguing. The ID gives access to your uh, income tax file to uh, to your uh, pension, and it's just misunderstanding access rights and identification. Yes, identifies you, but uh, I, I can show my social security number to any of you uh, if you want. And the lobby who fought that it wasn't patient association, it wasn't consumer association, it wasn't the government. It was the, the lobby of the physicians. Why that? And um, so there are those some actors that are, are not gaining in, in transparency. And uh, when I uh, was quite uh, debatative <coughs> about a parliament, about some topics, is that uh, if you want to block uh, something in Switzerland, you say, well, uh, there will be the loss of uh, work uh, places. Uh, and that with that argument you block everything, or you say data protection. And, uh, and, and this is used uh, a lot, and, uh, and those arguments are not used in, in northern countries. Plus, of course, uh, cultural uh, background. But on top of that, uh, this is a specific thing. There is a history of, of uh, non-trust, plus uh, people make business out of data silos. Thank you very much. Um, slightly shorter uh, answers because we have a lot of questions, but thanks for the in insight. Um, yes, next question, please. Um, just out of curiosity, does um, that Professor Bernstein, do you go on Google to go to dot, dot, go? <laughs> Sorry? Do you search for dot, dot, go on Google? It's just out of curiosity, but I actually have a real question. You can talk Do about I that. search for DuckDuckGo on Google? Yeah, because I'm not really sure how to... I've never heard of it before. DuckDuckGo? So. Uh, um, <laughs> no, I, 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 I do not search. Uh, so DuckDuckGo, it literally writes DuckDuckGo. I think it's .com, right? .com? I don't know, right? But DuckDuckGo, okay. spell it out in one word, .com. It's a search engine. It will not track you. Uh, you can obviously search for DuckDuckGo on Google and you will get the link and then click it 
And you can, most uh, modern browsers allow you to set it up as your standard search engine such that you type a query in the, in the, you know, the address field, it will immediately route it to DuckDuckGo, uh, among other things. Yeah, but my real question is, um, isn't it actually fair that the public is quite suspicious of how their data is used because we recently just found out about 500 million users of Yahoo had their accounts hacked and we literally found out about something that occurred two years ago. And so what do you, there, there might be the inability of scientists to actually let the public know what we're doing, so there's the issue of transparency, but most of all the public knows about this is also from the media, which is really sensation, which sensationalizes the news to get the public thinking about it a certain way. So what can we do as scientists to reassure sort of the public about the positive side of big data and how, like in which direction we can take it and why it's important? Go ahead. My answer to this question is just my personal thinking. It's actually, if we're thinking about hacking data, uh, which has occurred in, in Yahoo and big data, we should really sometimes just sort it out what is big data, what are databases, and what are just your personal emails which were hacked uh, out of um, maleficent uh, reasons. So. Maybe we, sh we should have broader discussions what is, what is even the term big data and not uh, because hacking an email account might be interesting for big data purposes, but um, it's done for, 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 um, for other reasons. So we should, we should clarify, I think, uh, also in the public discussions where, what is big mm -hmm. data and what is, what is other data that's around there. Maybe one additional round mark to that's the, the, the cool thing uh, from a statistician's point of view of big data is that you can infer information, uh, infer uh, uh, um, knowledge from information that is publicly available, that is available in even anonymous um, way, um, but you might also be able to track individuals without actually breaching any laws. But still, going back to the, the question of trust that you mentioned, so uh, how to instill more trust in uh, in society and also make clear what the differences are between big data on one hand and just data security on the other. Okay, let me, let me just try and tackle this very, really shortly. Okay, so I think there's multiple levels at which we can help to uh, uh, get trust uh, in place. One of which is we need to find techniques that will ensure privacy uh, if you choose to remain anonymous, right? So there is these techniques called differential privacy that Apple is saying that they're, they're, they're using right now to do these techniques. Um, I cannot explain to you what differential privacy is in, in, in like two minutes. The idea is if you query this data and you want to find out something about this data, there is no way of knowing whether you as a person were in the data set or not in the data set. That's kind of the intuition behind it. And that gives you, if you want to say so, cryptographic trust that nobody can use this data on, uh, uh, you know, statistically speaking, uh, to infer stuff about you. Uh, the systems that Serge does not talk about are systems where you can store your data and it's cryptographically, uh, you know, encrypted, and you have to you you have the key to decrypt it. And unless you give the consent that it's being decrypted, the person who stores the data can actually not do anything with it. Uh, whether these things will work or not work, uh, you know, ask Serge afterwards. He will gladly give you a long talk about this. I think those it's a fabulous initiative. So those are technical measures, right? So that's the first thing. I think on, on, on the higher level, and you're going to say I'm a broken record, we need to think about re legislation that will uh, you know, give us trust, for example, by enforcing uh, transparencies on certain kinds of data transactions, uh, such, uh, for example, in the medical domain. What is really happening with my data? Thank you very much. To, to a precise example, in the law that uh, will uh, come um, in, in enforced, uh, in April next year about the electronic health record. All uh, organizations operating such a platform uh, must uh, inform the government of any attack uh, that uh, has been done on the platform so that you don't hear about that two years later. And uh, log files of access to the data should be readable by the person owning the data. It doesn't protects again hacking, there are other means of uh, security audit, cryptography and so on, but the trust as you mentioned it's, it's a lot of uh, 
different things, uh, technology, transparency, uh, audits, third party, and, and uh, access, uh, the better control is done by the individual itself. Okay. Thank you very much. We have time for one last question. That's the winner. Where do we have the microphone? Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask if these issues will not be addressed in the future, if you think that more and more people will change and use the so-called darknet with a browser like Tor and use that kind of just to protect themselves if they have the feeling that nobody is addressing the issues that they have with security and privacy? Maybe you can ask it differently because um, it's more or less what we people do. So, who in here has heard of Tor? Tor. Okay, okay that's the that, selection bias. That, that clearly shows a selection <laughs> bias, right? You're not normal people. You're a couple of standard deviations off normal yeah. because you actually know what a standard deviation is, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> second question: Who uses it actually for daily activities? <laughs> Excellent. So that that kind of. <laughs> shows um, um, where we're heading to. Yes, the possibilities are there, but I guess they're very, very um, tedious also to implement. I mean, I have Tor installed and I hardly ever use it. Usually just of curiosity to see differences in search engine. That's um, <laughs> what I usually do. Um, yeah, but was that okay or would you like a response, a speculative response from the uh, panel? I don't think the, the majority of the population uh, will go into that just uh, because the gap in, in literacy and, and the cool services of, uh, of, uh, of those guys offering those nice services, easy to use, uncomplicated, uh, it's, uh, it's strong and I like those services. Great. Um, thank you very much. We're already over time. Um, the speakers will all stay for the April, I hope. A little <laughs> bit, a little bit. Um, so you can um, ask some more questions. If I could have 10 seconds for yeah. some advertisement. Uh, the project we didn't talk about, but... Uh, you thought, and you thought coming here was free, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I resisted uh, a long time. The project is called Midata, and uh, it's a platform where people can store how their person has record. At the moment, uh, we are proposing that solution just to about 20 patients treated in, in Bern in one specific use case. But we have in the drawer a very interesting project uh, in the domain of citizen science where we'd like to uh, propose to students of uh, ETH and, and University of, uh, of Zurich and, and possibly also from uh, the um, University of Applied Science of Bern to participate to uh, to studies, some uncritical, like measuring your glycemic response uh, to different uh, meals and feed that information for monitoring for diabetic patient. Would you agree to do that so that it helps other people? And another um, uh, project we have in, in the drawer, because it has to go through all the ethics approval, is uh, would you agree to um, to uh, um, enter your genome in that in that database and do tests of all your olfactive <coughs> capabilities to see if we can infer uh, infer um, correlation? And the real question is not about those correlation. It's uh, are you uh, do you agree to enter in those uh, in those kind of project? Uh, what is the, the governance needed? And how far are we, uh, and what are the problems? But it's it's in preparation, so early right. next year. I see at Midata time runs slower, um, but it's only fair. You were looking for PhD students, you were looking for citizen science, so um, we advertised for each advertised the debating club. The advertising is over. Um, first of all, thank you very much for coming here tonight. Um, thanks to the debating club for participating. Thanks to you two. I have a little something for you. Uh, 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 uh.
First, of course, uh, some advertisements from our side. Um, <laughs> fancy USB stick from Reach. But you know, in the age of big data and um, easy Dropbox accounts, etc., it you hardly ever use these USB sticks anymore. So for that, they have a second purpose, which is a bottle opener. And um, we, of course, also provide you with the bottles. So first, Sebastian. Thanks. 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 A round of applause for our participants. <laughs> So, you were standing here long, you get the heavier ones. <laughs> there you go. So, thanks a lot for coming. Um, thanks. Promise three last remarks next day. So 1st of October, sign up for the um, debating and communication training. Then on 5th of October, the debating club is holding um, their um, weekly know. meeting. No, uh, we're, we're holding an introductionary meeting oh, to, um, to introduce you to competitive debating, which is uh, rather more controversial and a lot more on the argumentation side and not so based on facts as you have seen those two. Why well, there are no facts here. <laughs> um, yeah, so one other thing, we too in the, of the debating club actually took a position which we chose to argue for it doesn't reflect our own our, our own opinion. So <laughs> Great, so 5th of October, introductory meeting and uh, our next public event from REACH is going to be on the 22nd of November and there it's going to be on the use of uh, basic research not in the sciences, but in the humanities. So thanks a lot for coming, and enjoy the afro.